Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Genomics in the Clinic, Medical Ethics and Policy, presented by Dr. Amy McGuire. We're excited to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. For more information, please visit labroots.com. My name is Soon Pham. I'm from LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you can at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located at the lower left of the presentation window and type in your question in the box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice that we'll be, you'll be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge this window, click on the screen icon located on the lower right hand corner. Finally, if you have trouble viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window, or just use the Q&A button at the lower left and type in the question and let us know that you're having a problem. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Amy McGuire. Dr. McGuire is the Leon Jaworski Professor of Biomedical Ethics and Director of the Center for Medical Ethics and Health Policy at Baylor College of Medicine. She is nationally recognized for her research on ethical, legal, and social issues in biomedicine, with a particular focus on the research ethics and the clinical integration of emerging genomic technologies. Currently, she is studying issues related to genomic data sharing, the policy implications of emerging business models for next generation sequencing, and the ethics and psycho psychosocial impact of whole genome and whole exome sequencing. Her research is funded by the NIH, NIH, NHGRI, NCI, and the NICHD. She has served on the National Advisory Council for Human Genome Research Institute and is currently a member of the Advisory Committee for the Greenwald Faculty Scholars Program in Bioethics. Dr. McGuire is the recipient of two Fulbright and Jaworski LLP Faculty Excellent Awards for Teaching and Evaluation and Educational Leadership. Please join me in welcoming Dr. McGuire. I will now turn it over to her for her presentation. Okay, thank you, Soon. Um, good afternoon, everybody. It's, it's great to be with you virtually um, for this uh, hour that we have. And I'm gonna talk to you today about some of the medical ethics and policy issues as we start to integrate genomics into clinical care. So um, it's always helpful to remember that in 2007, it was the first time we had ever done whole genome sequencing on an individual human being. And in the less than 10 years since then, um, it's estimated that by the end of this year, we'll have done whole genome sequencing on about a million individuals worldwide. And as you can see from this graph, following any of these various possible trajectories, the number of sequences that we will have, we be, be doing in the next 10 years is going to be exponential. Um, and so I think this really indicates and shows that whole genome sequencing and whole exome sequencing are being rapidly integrated and adapted into um, routine clinical care. Um, as the director of uh, the National Institutes of Health in the United States, Francis Collins, has predicted over the course of the next few decades, the availability of cheap, efficient DNA sequencing technology will lead to a medical landscape in which each baby's genome is sequenced, combined with the use of, of mobile health technology to assist in real-time monitoring of such things as diet, exercise, blood pressure, heart rate, and blood chemistries, the vision of the quantified self will become a reality for many of us. So this is sort of the prediction and the vision of what the future of genomics and precision medicine are going to look like. And in fact, we're currently already integrating genomics into um, clinical care in a variety of settings. Uh, this is a paper actually from a couple years ago out of the Baylor College of Medicine whole genome sequencing lab, um, where we were reporting on the first 2,000 whole exome sequences that we had done primarily on children with undiagnosed genetic diseases. And um, in that population, uh, we were actually able to, uh, to have a diagnostic yield of 25%. Um, and these are kids who had been on long diagnostic odysseys and had really had no uh, diagnostic information prior to whole exome sequencing. And more recently, um, we've reported results from our cancer genomics lab um, for the first 150 pediatric cancer patients who had gotten uh, tumor and germline sequencing. And in that population, we found uh, that there were somatic mutations of established clinical utility 
in 3% of, of that cohort, and somatic mutations of potential clinical utility in 24%. Um, looking at the germline in these individuals, we found that diagnostic germline findings related to cancer in 10%. So I think both of these papers um, and what we're seeing coming out of other groups as well shows that there is some clinical utility and quite a bit of clinical utility in doing whole genome and whole exome sequencing, um, particularly for certain patient populations that have particular phenotypes. But what about individuals who don't have any known phenotype that we're trying to diagnose? Um, so this is a study that we're working on in collaboration um, with Robert Green from Brigham and Women's Hospital and, and uh, Harvard Medical School called the MedSeq study. And it's a randomized trial of integrating whole genome sequencing into clinical care in two patient populations and primary care patients, as well as cardiology patients who have been diagnosed with cardiomyopathies. And in this particular study, um, individuals are randomized to either receive whole genome sequencing or to receive standard of care, which it, it, for us is um, just a, uh, enhanced medical uh, history, family history. And we're returning uh, to the participants in the study information about Mendelian disease risk that are secondary findings, carrier status, and any cardiac risk allele that we find. And we're reporting findings from a variant analysis of about 4,600 genes. And you, as you can see from, from this chart, in about 21% of the cases um, out of the 100 who have been sequenced, uh, we found Mendelian disease risk secondary findings. And in 92% of the cases, we found carrier status uh, findings. Um, of those who are in the cardiology cohort, which were 50 individuals, about half of them had a diagnostic finding related to their cardiomyopathy. Of those, uh, 20 of them, or 40%, had previously received a positive genetic result from a cardiomyopathy panel, and 95% of those results were confirmed. And then of those who had not received a previous finding on the panel, 13% of them had a positive result on whole genome sequencing. So again, we're find, finding quite a bit of clinical utility and diagnostic yield um, using whole genome and whole exome sequencing in the clinical care of patients. But not everybody is interested in getting their whole genome sequencing information back or undergoing whole genome um, testing in the clinic. And so uh, we have two studies that are kind of looking at how individuals um, use and, and choose to use uh, whole genome and whole exome sequencing. So the first one I already described, which is the MedSeq study, um, which was the randomized trial of whole genome sequencing in primary care and cardiology. And then we have a similar study uh, also with Robert Green and Alan Beggs from um, Boston Children's Hospital and Brigham and Women's Hospital, which is a randomized trial examining the impact of integrating whole genome sequencing into the care of newborns. And in both of these um, studies, we have found that a large portion of individuals who are contacted about study participation actually actively decline participation in the study. So um, we have recently finished enrollment into the MedSeq study, and um, based on the numbers that we had at the time of this analysis, you can see here that 34% of individuals actively declined um, participation, and 51% uh, uh, decided not to get sequenced, which means that they either were unresponsive um, or actively declined. And in the BabySeq study, we've even had a larger uh, decline rate of 74% of parents who are not interested in having their baby sequenced, which was kind of surprising to us because we had done a hypothetical survey of the same population of women who had just given birth in the hospitals that we are recruiting from and asked them how interested they would be to have their child genome sequenced, and about 80% said they would be very interested in participating in a study to have their child's genome sequenced. So I think that's a good lesson in how some people um, may say that they're, that they're interested in something or have a preference for something, but when it comes to actual decision making, um, they may make an entirely different decision. So why were these individuals not interested in getting their genome sequenced? Um, there were many reasons that they gave for, for those who declined participation of why they declined participation. The most common reason was because of the study logistics. These are both very involved studies, and, and they both involved quite a bit of longitudinal surveying and um, a large time commitment on behalf of the patients or the parents of the patients. 
Um, but they also gave ethical, legal, or social reasons for why they were not interested in participating in these studies. And the two primary um, LC or ethical, legal, social reasons that they gave were that they were concerned about their privacy and about potential discrimination. And they were concerned about the potential psychological impact of receiving unwanted results from whole genome or whole exome sequencing. So let me talk about each of these a little bit in turn. With regard to privacy and genetic discrimination, uh, this is something that we've heard quite a lot over the years, that individuals generally and the public at large has a lot of concerns about potential genetic discrimination. Um, and this is an interesting public concern because we haven't seen too many um, really documented cases of egregious genetic discrimination, but we have a lot of anecdotal evidence that it happens and it exists. Um, and so in the United States, we passed a law in 2008, a federal law called the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, which protects against genetic discrimination in the context of health insurance and employment. Um, it is not a comprehensive uh, protection. So, indivi so individuals can still be discriminated against based on their genetic information in life insurance, long-term care, disability, and other non-insurance non and non-employment um, contexts. And what's really interesting is we recently did a, a survey using Mechanical Turk um, mechanism on Amazon in 2014, and we surveyed almost 1,500 individuals in the United States. And we wanted to get a sense of how effective has this law, GINA, been in allaying individuals' fears about genetic discrimination. And what we found is that 79% of our respondents were unaware of the fact that GINA existed or what the law was. And this was compared to only 30% who are unaware of uh, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, or HIPAA, 21% who are unaware of the American with Disabilities Act, and only 3% who are unaware of the Affordable Care Act. So we tried to ask them about similar federal legislation that applied in the United States, just to get a, a, a source of comparison. We then gave them a description of what HIPAA protects and what, it, I mean, I'm sorry, what GINA protects and what it doesn't protect. And what was very interesting is we said, okay, now have, knowing that this law exists, are you more or less concerned about genetic discrimination and about your privacy? And 25% of our respondents were less concerned about discrimination, but 30% were actually more concerned about discrimination. And I think it's because they realized that this is potentially something that they needed to be concerned about, that they hadn't really thought about. And they also realized that the law in the United States is not a comprehensive law that protects them against discrimination in all forums. Now, other countries do have more extensive protections from a legal perspective for genetic discrimination. And one example is the Human Tissue Act of 2004. And um, this is a, a law that actually criminalizes the uh, use of DNA for analysis without explicit consent in most circumstances. And so this is a much stronger protection against uh, the use and analysis of genetic information without consent. So now turning to the second uh, LC concern that we heard from our, from our decliners, um, the potential psychological impact of, of genomic testing. And this is something that you also hear a lot of, of concern about with regard to what are the risks of, of integrating whole genome sequencing and whole exome sequencing into clinical care. So what do the data tell us about how people do respond to the genetic or genomic information that they're getting? Well, some of the early studies looked at how people responded to particular genetic testing information. So one of the most well-known studies is a decades-old study called the REVEAL study that looked at individuals who are at risk for Alzheimer's disease. And they tested them for the APOE gene um, variants and uh, told them whether they had a genetic increased, genetically increased risk of getting Alzheimer's disease. And then they looked to see whether um, that created anxiety or depression uh, for those who had positive results and as compared to individuals who didn't get uh, the, geno the genetic information. And what they basically found, which you can see um, on the, the graph here on the side of the, um, of the slide, is that there was no significant difference um, sort of over time in their levels of anxiety. Um, now, the other uh, study that's on this slide is a study that looked at individuals who are getting sort of genome-wide information using a panel through the company Navigenics when they were offering direct-to-consumer 
genomic profiling. And what they found also is that uh, primary analyses showed no significant differences between baseline and follow-up in anxiety symptoms for individuals who had gotten uh, genome-wide um, testing done. So we're also looking at um, the impact of doing whole genome sequencing um, from a psychological perspective on individuals in the primary care setting, as well as in the setting of cardiology uh, or cardiomyopathies in the MedSeq study. So this is really the first study that's kind of looking at this in a randomized fashion for individuals who are both ostensibly healthy, as well as individuals who have a particular um, uh, disease uh, phenotype. And what we have found so far, and this is preliminary data, is that there really is no significant difference between our control group and the individuals who get whole genome sequencing and their levels of anxiety or depression over time from baseline to six months post-disclosure. And um, something important to point out here is that even at baseline, all of our anxiety and depression scores fall within the normal range, which is um, zero to seven, and this is on a six-point scale. So you can see that they're all in the normal range. Um, and that they don't significantly increase or even really decrease um, based on randomization arm. Um, but one of the questions that has come up for us is whether, although there might, it doesn't seem to be that there are significant clinical psychological impacts um, or sequelae from receiving whole genome or whole exome sequencing, are there more nuanced sort of social um, phenomena that are taking place? And so one of the concerns is, particularly with newborns, if you're doing whole genome and whole exome sequencing, is how is going to, how are they, uh, how are individuals, parents, um, and others going to respond to risk information about their newborns? And is it going to impact the way that they interact with those children as they go through life? Is it going to impact the way that they interact with each other? Is it going to impact the way that they uh, the expectations that they have internally for how their, their children perform and, um, and, and what they do in their life. And so um, in our baby seek study where we're sequencing newborns, those are some of the outcomes that we are studying. And, and we don't have enough data to present that here, but just to give you a sense of what we're looking at, we're looking at whether um, getting genomic information, particularly risk information for newborns, um, creates sort of this sense of a, of a vulnerable child where um, parents are more likely to be worried every time their child gets sick, to take them to the pediatrician more frequently, um, to have, you know, anxiety about the health of their child. Um, we're also looking at whether it has an impact on parent-child bonding and attachment, and we're using uh, various validated measures for that. And then we're looking at the impact on the uh, partnership relationship, the marital relationship, and whether it increases or even decreases um, marital conflict. And so those are some of the, the important outcomes that we, we're looking at with regard to um, how this type of technology integrated into newborn care uh, might impact children. And we're hoping to do that more longitudinally so we can see um, what those impacts are. So that's sort of the, the, the first set of issues that I wanted to discuss around the clinical integration of um, whole genome and whole exome sequencing. Um, the second set of issues that I really wanted to talk about is um, what I think is really one of the biggest bottlenecks to the effective and ethical integration of genomics into clinical care. So we can sequence individuals and we can get tons of information about them, um, but knowing what to do with that information and knowing what it means for that individual or that family um, is where we can run into a lot of, of difficult and challenging issues um, and where the science kind of lags behind the technology. So I'm going to share a case study uh, that I think illustrates the need for uh, more robust databases and then talk a little bit about um, some research that we're doing looking at how we can increase data sharing and develop the types of databases that will help move this forward. So this is a story about um, an individual who, who I know. Um, and uh, it's a baby named Hannah who was born without complication in July of 2015. So she's almost a year old. Um, and at the time of her birth, she was, uh, she was born in a state that requires newborn screening as a public health measure, as most states in the United States do. And when she, her parents got back her newborn screening results, they found that she had a positive result, which, which clinically referred to as newborn screen, screening failed. And they repeated it multiple times, and she continued to get a positive result. 
So she was thought to have a particular um, deficiency that didn't really make sense from the perspective of, of how she was presenting. She seemed to be a perfectly healthy child um, as she was presenting uh, to the physicians and to her parents. And so the recommendation from a clinical perspective was to get a genetic panel done to confirm the finding on the newborn screen. And the panel did not confirm the finding. So they, um, they ruled that out. So now they really didn't know what was going on with Hannah, and the recommendation was to do whole exome sequencing and mitochondrial sequencing to try to get some answers of what might be going on from a clinical perspective. So um, they conducted the whole exome sequencing and they found a variant of uncertain significance associated with propionic acidemia, but her enzyme levels seemed to be okay. And so the physician said, well, if she has this propionic acidemia, then it's most likely to be a very, very mild case of it, and it's not something to worry about. About a week later, they received her mitochondrial sequencing results, and it revealed a de novo mutation in the ATP6 gene, and she was 100% homo homoplastic for this. So the geneticists who were doing this analysis went to the databases and said, what, what is this mutation in the ATP6 gene mean? What does it mean for Hannah? How can we interpret this? What can we tell her parents? So what they found in, in the published literature were that, that, that there were four published cases of this particular mutation. Um, and all of the published cases had been found in kids who had been symptomatic with a disease called Lee's disease. Now Lee's disease, which I wasn't familiar with before I heard this case, apparently is a really devastating um, disease that um, occurs in childhood. And the way it's been described to me from my by my clinical colleagues is that it's essentially like ALS in kids, where children will develop symptoms of the disease and they will then become progressively paralyzed and ultimately die within a couple of years. So it's a terrible, terrible disease and not something that you want to hear that your beautiful, presumably perfectly healthy newborn child um, might get or might have. The problem is, is that in the databases, there were no known cases of an asymptomatic child with this particular ma uh, mutation. So what do we make of this? We have four cases of individuals who were symptomatic with Lee's disease where this mutation was found. No asymptomatic children where we have found this particular mutation. But is that because they weren't tested? Um, mitochondrial sequencing isn't done routinely on all healthy children. Usually it's only done on children who have uh, problems. Um, and the major problem is that our databases are therefore incomplete. And so we don't know if this particular mutation only exists in children with Lee's disease. We don't know how um, penetrant it is, if it's 100% penetrant or it's, it's much less so. And we don't know um, what this means for Hannah. So in talking to Hannah's mother, she said, you know, looking back when she was waiting for the whole exome sequencing results to come back, she said, all I wanted then was her genetic sequencing results. She said, but in retrospect, those really caused much more emotional pain and uncertainty for her family than they did help because now they have this sort of situation where they have a beautiful, um, currently healthy child uh, who they really have a tremendous amount of uncertainty about whether she might get this devastating disease um, and what sort of that genetic mutation means for her. Um, and yet there's nothing they can do about it in the short term. So I think that, that this case really illustrates why we need to build up our databases so that we have a better understanding when we identify a particular mutation, what it might mean for the individual patient in front of us. And so this, th there's been a lot of um, work being done over the last several years to talk about how can we um, share data across institutions? Um, how can we share data internationally? How can we share data from clinical labs and research labs and really be able to build robust databases that can help us with the interpretation piece of the pipeline of clinical genomics? And so I just show here one of the reports that came out in 2011 um, by the National Academies of Sciences where they really sort of set forth this vision of needing to build what they call a medical information commons. And this is an idea of a data repository that links layers of molecular data, medical histories, including information on social and physical environments and health outcomes to individual patients. 
And the, the vision was that data would be continuously contributed by the research community from the medical records of participating patients. And at the time, I think the thought was that this would be somewhat like Google Maps and it would be one sort of centralized database. And I think now we're seeing more and more um, models that are being developed that are more um, locally controlled and federated. But this idea of having sort of very, very robust, deeply phenotyped um, linked information, including genomic information, is one that is uh, truly the vision for how we're going to get to where we want to get to with genomic medicine. So one way that we're trying to do this in the United States recently is through the President Obama's Precision Medicine Initiative, which was announced um, about a year and a half ago. And the Precision Medicine Initiative is an effort to disrupt the old paradigm of carrying out scores of studies designed to yield narrow results by creating this massive research cohort that would collect health information from at least a million volunteers from sources as disparate as medical records, genetic, genetic analysis, smartphones, or wearable sensors. So it's a very broad vision. We now have sort of the uh, cancer um, cohort that's being built by the National Cancer Institute in service to the Cancer Moonshot Project that, that Vice President Joe Biden is, is leading. Um, but this is, this is the effort on the United States part to really develop large research cohorts. And the Precision Medicine Initiative has issued its first um, round of funding announcements to fund cohorts that would contribute uh, or, or groups that would contribute to these, this cohort. Um, and I just want to point out that, that I'm, I'm talking about the United States, but there are many other national biobanks um, at the international level. And here are just a couple of examples, but I'm, I'm certainly not being exhaustive. Um, and there are a lot of groups and countries that are trying to develop these large research cohorts to help with uh, genomic interpretation. So there are several different models um, that have developed with regard to data repositories over the last several years. And um, this is a slide that is adapted from Heidi Rehm um, that really so shows kind of three uh, key models. One is the centralized database that I think was originally envisioned by the National Academies of Sciences in its report in 2011, where um, everyone submits data to a single centralized database, and we see some initiatives that are using the centralized database model. Uh, the second model here is the centralized hub, where um, you have um, each database is sort of connected to a centralized hub, and you might go through the hub to access the data, but then it's um, outsourced to the individual um, sites or locations to, um, to control the data uh, locally. And then we have the federated model where all databases are connected through multiple sort of arrangements and agreements. And you can see here that there's um, a lot of different uh, research initiatives that are using these various models and adapting them. But I think ultimately what we are going to have to accomplish is not just one research repository, but a networked environment of various different data repositories. And I think in an ideal world, this would be an internationally networked environment. Um, we obviously have to deal with not just data coming from multiple sources like technology companies, government programs, research consortia, healthcare systems and clinical labs, um, NGOs, et cetera, but also them coming from different countries that have different uh, regulatory um, frameworks and different jurisdictional issues that need to be um, attended to, as well as different cultural norms and, um, and values. So one of the major problems um, that prevents us from getting there is this, this problem of the non-commons. And, and this is a, a slide that was created by my colleague, Bob Cook Deegan, um, who loves this slide. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a neat representation. And it kind of shows and it depicts sort of the problem that we've seen. Um, and kind of the poster child for this problem of the non-commons has been the Myriad um, group. And this is, you know, the, the, group, the uh, company that um, patented the BRCA gene mutation. This was the source of a huge uh, United States Supreme Court case in, in uh, the past year. Um, and in that Supreme Court case, it was determined that um, Myriad could not hold a patent, um, a valid patent on the gene mutation for BRCA. Um, but we quickly realized that actually the value that Myriad had was not only the patent on the gene, 
but it was in fact the variant database that it held as a proprietary trade secret. So they had, um, you know, done testing on millions of women over the last decade and had identified new variants in the BRCA gene um, that had been shown to be associated with breast and ovarian cancer. And those particular variants were being held as proprietary trade secrets in their own proprietary database and were not being shared um, with other researchers. So if somebody or other clinicians, so if another lab was doing a BRCA test on an individual patient and they discovered a variant, they may not have resources or the database um, to be able to interpret that variant based on past cases. So this is the problem of the non-commons. Um, and I just want to tell you a little bit about some of the research that we've been do doing to address uh, the issue of data sharing and building a medical information commons. So the first project that we had was a project called PolySeq. Um, and in this project, it was kind of a, a, a big project. We did a lot of things in it. But one of the things that we did is we had a, um, we used a Delphi process and we engaged experts uh, from a variety of different um, disciplines and stakeholder groups. And so this slide shows you sort of the, the types of experts, experts that we had, um, engaged. And these were people that have really been thinking about data sharing at a very high level, from LC scholars to genomic researchers to funders, patient advocates, um, clinical translational researchers, regulators and policymakers, payers, and then, and then a group of other individuals. We had 43 individuals, and in a Delphi process, what you do is you're not trying to get generalizable sort of um, opinions, but you're trying to deeply engage these individuals who are knowledgeable and are experts on the topic over a series of um, four engagements where you're doing in-depth surveys, and we did focus groups with them, and we tried to build on their input to get deeper and deeper into um, this particular topic. And so in the first two engagements with them, we had them identify and rank what they thought were the most important policy challenges that would present um, a barrier to the clinical integration of next generation sequencing. And we focused on the United States because it was just more manageable, although we recognize that, the, that similar or different issues might come up internationally. And we identified 19 policy challenges that they then added to and they ranked um, in order of importance. And what we found was the issue of data sharing tied for the most important policy challenge that they thought could be the biggest barrier to the clinical integration of genomics or next generation sequencing. But they also ranked data sharing as the least feasible to address. They thought it would be very, very difficult um, to address the issue of data sharing. We then asked them for some of their, you know, contextual opinions and perspectives on some of these issues, and we asked them whether companies should be able to maintain private variant databases as protected trade secrets, as Myriad was doing with the BRCA uh, variant database. And you can see here that the vast majority of them either strongly disagreed or disagreed that companies should be able to maintain these private variant databases. So, um, you know, I think it's really important to think about data sharing and, um, and I think it's now starting to be viewed as a real moral imperative that individuals share their data. Um, this is a, a paper from New England Journal of Medicine that came out a couple months ago and it really kind of got, you know, um, a huge negative reaction because it was about data sharing and it talked about the concern that secondary researchers might be considered sort of research parasites who are getting, who are using data that they didn't collect and kind of getting all the credit and stealing the fame. And the, um, there's sort of a cartoon about this. It says, hi guys, I'm Sucky, the research parasite. I'm going to steal all your data and take all the credit. And that was, you know, that was sort of like scientists and, and others came out and said, how, how could you say that? And this is really setting us back a, a lot in, in research. And so um, the Jeff Drazen, who um, is, was one of the authors and one of the editors of New England Journal of Medicine wrote a clarification a couple days later and says, you know, New England Journal of Medicine believes that there is a moral obligation to the people who volunteer to participate in clinical trials to ensure that their data are widely and responsibly used. So this is recognition that we really do have a moral imperative to share data. And this, this sort of imperative to share data is really deeply grounded in the culture of genomics um, and the genomics community. And this dates back to the early days of the Human Genome Project, where we had the Bermuda principles that got developed that basically called for the rapid public release of all generated sequence data um, very quickly. 
And the rationale behind that was that this is a public resource and individual labs is very expensive to generate sequence data. Individual labs across the globe were generating parts of the sequence data. And if we could get that out there into the public domain as quickly as possible, it would speed the science, it would benefit researchers, um, and it would prevent sort of the privatization of um, the genome. Um, so the Bermuda principles have really sort of formed a framework or foundation for how we think about data sharing um, in the genomics world. But this slide really just shows that we're not in Bermuda anymore. Um, things have gotten a lot more complicated, and I don't want to underestimate how complicated it was and how difficult it was at the time to come to an agreement and develop the Bermuda principles because it was really challenging um, the ways in which science was typically done. And it was really sort of um, paradigm shifting in terms of, of the culture and the values of making data broadly available and who gets credit and those sorts of things. But if it was hard back in 1996 when we, when we um, had the Bermuda Principles written, it's in, exponentially more difficult today. And I'm going to give you a couple of reasons of why I think it's become so much more difficult. The first is that back when we, had, when we wrote the Bermuda Principles, there were five countries involved um, in the Human Genome Project. China was added in 1999. You could basically get 50 people in, in a room, and they were sort of all of the, most of the people that were going to be impacted by the policy that was developed. So they could all give their input and be part of the process. Today, we have global pro programs with many cultural differences. Um, there's, you know, thousands upon thousands of individuals who are, who are working in this space, um, and they all are dealing with different um, cultural differences, jurisdictional differences, institutional differences, um, and so it's very, very difficult to get complete buy-in and consensus on how to move forward. And this is just a an indication of some of the guidelines and policies that have been developed by various groups internationally, just to show you um, the extent of diversity of uh, groups and individuals that are thinking about data sharing norms. The second issue has to do with privacy and identifiability. So back in 1996, it was assumed that if we publicly released sequence data that wasn't linked to um, patient identifying information, uh, then it was de-identified and privacy was being protected. But we now know that you can no longer de-identify completely um, DNA data. And one of the first papers that came out um, about this in 2004 really showed that you could use um, genomic information, you could identify individuals if you had a reference sample and if you linked it to a particular database that had sequence data in it, and all you had to have access to was about 30 to 80 statistically independent SNP positions to identify um, that the individual uh, that you had a reference sample for was in that database. So this raised a lot of questions about are we adequately protecting privacy of individuals who contribute their genomic information to these types of databases. Um, we had a paper on this that talked about the fact that you can no longer de-identify data and what does that mean from a policy perspective. And then a couple of years later, we had papers starting to come out showing that not only could you identify individuals from um, individual level genomic data, but also from aggregate genomic data. And then this culminated really in a paper that came out in 2013 by a group from MIT that found that you could actually identify individuals who are in large research genomic databases um, without a reference sample. And so this was a group that looked at, um, they, it matched YSTR data from the Thousand Genomes database project, uh, project database to uh, genetic genealogy databases and was able to actually identify about 50 individuals um, doing a, a Google search over a couple hours. And so a lot of people have, have sort of looked at, at these studies and said, well, what's the big deal? Um, it's, it's not that easy to do this, and what's the real risk, and why are we worrying so much about privacy? And others have looked at this and said, well, this is, this is really compelling, and we need to protect individuals, and so we need to strengthen our privacy protections and our security and, and how we're um, dealing with the sharing of genomic data. So whatever side you fall on, I think there's no denying that this actually just complicates the issue a lot more than um, what we knew in 1996. Um, the next two issues have to do with the diversity of the data. So back in 1996, um, with the Bermuda Principles, we were really dealing primarily with human sequence data. And now I think there's a recognition that we need layers of genomic data as well as metabolomics, proteomics, imaging, environmental 
data, so we want to link it. We don't, we don't only want diversity of data, we want to link it to individuals. Um, and this idea that if you have completely sort of anonymous, if you can, you know, you know, we know you can't anonymize DNA data, but anonymized DNA data is really no longer that useful to us. We need to know who it came from, we need to have longitudinal data, and we need to have context. Um, and so that's a much more complicated thing to try to manage. So again, I bring us back to this idea of building a medical information commons and this idea of having layers of data that's linked to individuals was very clearly set out by the um, National Academies of Science in 2011 in their report. So finally, I think there's a diversity of commercial interests that didn't exist back in 1996, where the one goal of the Human Genome Project was to sequence the human genome. That was sort of the overriding goal. Um, and everybody was on board that that's what they wanted to accomplish. Now we have many, many kinds of companies with disparate business models and um, very different motivations for why they're in this space. And so this is a paper I'll just reference that um, we published in 2014 in um, the journal Nature Biotechnology. And we looked at a bunch of companies that were involved in next generation sequencing. Um, and we sort of mapped what area along the sequencing pipeline were they involved in. And you can see from the, from the graphic here, um, these represent individual companies and what they're doing all the way from you know, developing and selling consumables and arrays to, you know, producing sequencing instruments and supplying those, conducting the sequencing, aligning and, annotate, and annotating um, the sequences that were being done, interpretation and reporting, and data storage and, and bundling. And this is, again, not an exhaustive list, but these are the kinds of things that these very various companies are engaged in. And what they're actually doing is going to um, impact what their motivation is, whether they have access to data, or whether they can share data, and what, um, what impact sort of different uh, legal regulatory issues have on them as a company. So I think where we're at now is um, really trying to figure out as a community, how do we incentivize data sharing? And I feel really strongly that although we may agree that as a scientific community, it is a moral imperative if we're going to offer whole genome and whole exome sequencing to patients in a clinical context, that we have robust enough databases to be able to give them answers to what we find. Um, and so there may be a moral imperative to share data, um, broadly speaking. And we can, we can argue about that, but let's, let's just assume that. But even if it is a moral imperative, I don't think that's enough. It can't just be a moral imperative. So um, many people have pointed out that we need a business imperative for change and innovation based on the needs of our customers. And that the barriers to sharing are really a lack of enabling infrastructure, data governance, uniform policies, appropriately constrained standards, and economic incentives. So we need to be thinking about this not just from an ethical and moral perspective, but also from a business perspective. So this leads me back to our policy Delphi that we did in rounds three and four of that, of that project. Um, we took sort of the top ranking policy challenges and then we asked them, what should we do about this? And so with regard to data sharing, um, we asked them, what are potential solutions for dealing with this issue of data sharing and, and companies having proprietary databases and not sharing data. And so this is a little bit of a difficult graph to read, but um, you can see here in the, um, the blue line show sort of what there was support for. So um, you can see here that down here, um, there was support, really the highest level of support was for making data sharing and the possibility of independent verification a condition of approval or clearance, certification or accreditation. So using sort of our existing mechanisms like the FDA or the, the CMS or, or CAP accreditation to basically say you have to share data um, and making it a condition. Another, another option that there was some support for was using positive economic incentives so that payers reimburse more for tests from laboratories that share data. And the one, the one that received the, less, the least amount of support was this option of doing nothing. And that, you know, the idea that you can't compel data disclosure in this space. Um, and people were really opposed to that concept that, that we can do nothing and just let this happen. So now what we're doing in, in our group um, to build on that project is we have another grant that's called Building the Medical Information Commons, and it's, it's looking at participant engagement and policy. 
And we have a fantastic advisory committee and group of, of investigators and co-investigators that are really trying to grapple with this issue of how can we create a medical information commons. And we had a really exciting first meeting um, back in March where we got all of these individuals who have tremendous expertise in this area and have been thinking about this area from their own perspectives of being you know, somebody who works in a clinical lab or somebody who's running a governmental program or somebody who's in academia, or we had also people who were in the tech industry who were doing this from, from that perspective, um, and having them all sit in a room together and be able to say, okay, well, this is what's important to us, but this is what's important to you guys, and can how can we work together to try to think through the business incentives as well as the ethical um, imperative to share data and create this medical information commons. And so go the goal of our project is to engage expert stakeholders to inform policy, policy decisions about effective governance for data sharing while using deliberative methods to obtain informed public input to make sure that the values, rights, and interests of in individuals whose data populate the information commons are represented. So we're doing that in three stages. We're currently working on a landscape analysis, really trying to get a handle on what are the different initiatives that are out there in these different spaces and how are they sharing data? What models are they using um, and what are they currently doing? And then we're going to be interviewing expert stakeholders, including members of our advisory panel, but as well as, as other individuals, um, to try to get a sense of, of how well identified models of what's currently going on address key policy issues and to explore innovative ideas for addressing unresolved issues. And then finally, we're going to take sort of a couple of different models that are that are being developed in terms of how we create this medical information commons um, to members of the public through citizens panels. And this is really an in-depth way of exploring the values and soliciting public input about these key policy issues um, and the ways to address innovative, innovative problems. Um, and so we'll be doing citizens panels across the United States to try to get this really, really in-depth um, informed public input on some of these issues. So we're really, really excited about this project. This is some very preliminary data based on the first 22 initiatives that we've done extensive data collection on, and this is from a publicly available um, data on the internet. But you can see the kinds of data that are being banked. Um, it's not just genetic data anymore. Um, it's not just sequence data anymore. It's data, it's, it's proteins and phenotypes, um, images, demographics, other kinds of information. So this gets back to the issue of linking data. Um, and you can see the kinds of data sharing models that are being adopted. So of the 22 that we initially looked at, about 32% of them have the centralized model, 64% use a centralized hub, and about 5% are currently using a federated model. And there might be other models out there that we need to explore as well that, that offer alternative types of structures. So I just want to um, kind of, I'm getting close to ending, but I want to point out what participants' perspectives are on this and what we know about that from our own work. So this is from a, a study that was done actually several years ago, but we asked individuals who were being recruited into genomic studies, and these were primarily patients who were sick themselves or parents of pediatric patients who had sick kids. And they were asked to, they were being asked to participate in genomic studies, have their biological specimens stored and used for genomic analysis, and then to have their data shared. And we did a randomized trial of different types of consents that gave varying amounts of control over the decision to share their data. And the, the different options we gave them is whether their data could be shared in publicly accessible databases or open access databases versus shared in these controlled access databases where you have to go through like a data access committee to um, get the data or not shared at all. And then at the end of the study, we sort of told everybody, we debriefed them and said, here's what we did, here are all the options for you, and how would you like to have your data shared? So at the end of the study, when we gave everybody all of the options, the majority of our participants agreed to share their data either publicly, which was 53% of them, or in controlled access databases, which was 33% of them. Now, their motivation for sharing their data was really altruistic. They wanted to advance research. And I have to do a caveat here, which is that, you know, our participants, although we had, I think, 335 participants, so it wasn't a small number, but these were all individuals who were sick um, and they were highly motivated to participate in research. They were all in a large academic medical setting. There was a high, high, high level of trust in the institution as well as in the physician that was at, uh, seeking their informed consent. 
And so this might not scale to other populations and we need to be very sensitive to um, variation in how people feel about this. And so, for example, we had a much smaller pilot study that we did with very disadvantaged, poor, primarily African-American um, participants who were HIV positive. And we asked them how they felt about sharing their data and we had kind of a very, very inverse um, finding, which was that most of them were concerned about sharing their data and they cared a lot more about their privacy um, and that outweighed their desire to advance research. So we do need to be sensitive to that. There might be other populations as well or individuals who have particular feelings about this that don't conform to the majority. Um, but for our participants also, we asked them um, how important what it was to them to be involved in the decision about sharing their data and 86% felt that it was very important for them to be involved. And we asked how they wanted to be involved and most of them just wanted to be asked. Um, and it wasn't because they were terribly concerned about their privacy. It was really about feeling respected as a participant in the research. Um, and so they felt like that was a really important aspect of respect for persons. So in our, in our new study that we're doing on building a medical information commons, we're gonna try to take the, this sort of survey interview data that we have from um, actual research participants and try to explore the values of the public underlying um, data sharing. And so we're gonna do this public deliberation and we're gonna look at public views on several of the ethical issues that come up, as well as try to get at the value tensions that are at stake when we talk about sharing data and building a medical information commons. And I just wanna end by pointing out that I think one of the major big elephants in the room when we talk about data sharing, when we talk about data repositories and, and medical information commons is this question of who owns your genetic data. And this is a photo, I don't know how, how many of you can see this well, but it's a, it's a photograph I found on the internet of an elephant on President Obama's back. And the reason I include uh, this picture of President Obama is because a couple months ago he held a, um, a conference in the White House around the Precision Medicine Initiative. And in the conference, he was sort of quoted as saying, I would like to think that if somebody does a test on me or my genes, that that's mine. But that's not always how we define these issues. So this really brings up the question of who owns your genetic data and what do we mean by ownership? I think what lawyers mean by ownership might be very, very different than what patients and participants think of when they say it's my data or I own the data. And what rights and obligations do those various meanings give rise to? And I think that's one of the critical issues that we need to address as we start moving towards um, building a medical information commons. So I will end there and open it up to questions and discussion. And I really appreciate your attention and your time. Well, thank you, Dr. McGuire, for that really informative presentation. I think the audience and I really enjoyed it. I think it's time for now for the question and answer session. If you have a question you'd like to ask Dr. McGuire, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button that's located at the lower left of the presentation window. Type in your question in the box that appears on the screen and click on the send button. We'll answer as many questions as we can today. So let's get started. The first question we have for Dr. McGuire is uh, from Alapati, um, and his question is pertaining to the case, uh, the case study that you brought up about Hannah. And he asks, "How do men get? How do you get men to participate in caring about healthcare results?" And uh, as a second question, he asks, um, "What can be used for non-symptomatic?" Um, for symptomatic health issues, such as in cases like Hannah's. Okay. Okay, thank you for, the, for those questions. So um, I'm, I, I hope I answer them. I'm not sure I fully understand the question. So if you wanna ask a follow-up and I'm not actually getting what you're asking, feel free to. Um, but how do we get men to care about um, healthcare results? So, you know, in this particular case of Hannah, this was a finding on mitochondrial sequencing. So this was an, an, you know, a, a female linked um, particular result. But for, for many findings, you know, they're equally relevant to men as they are to women. So I think they care about it. Um, with regard to newborn sequencing, you know, I do think that a lot of, of men care, care a lot about it. In our baby seek study, um, we're one of the few studies that are actually trying to survey 
the male partners um, when we're surveying parents of these children who are being sequenced. And a lot of the studies that we have, particularly around parental views or perspectives, really focus on the mom because the mom is typically the one who um, fills out the surveys and answers the questions. So we're, we're going to great lengths to try to get both mom and dad, where there is a mom and dad, um, to complete the surveys so that we have a better understanding of how dads and men feel about these issues as they relate to their newborn children. Um, the question about um, what, do you, what do you do with symptomatic health issues, um, I'm not 100% sure I understand that question, but you know, I think when we have individuals, we, we really use genomic sequencing in a couple different contexts. One is that you have an individual who has a particular phenotype, they're sick, and you're trying to get a, a, diagno a diagnosis. You're trying to understand what's going on with them. And in some cases, in the very few cases, actually, but you're trying, sometimes we can actually figure out not just what's going on with them, but is there something we can do um, to help improve their, their uh, prognosis or their health care. Um, in other cases, you may have somebody like Hannah who is currently asymptomatic, but you find that they have a genetic variant that shows that they're at increased risk for a particular disease or disorder. And for some of those, um, they're actionable. So there might be things, and this is sort of the, the public health justification for what's included on newborn screening panels, is that you're supposed to only be screening for things that not only occur in childhood, but that are actionable. So you can do something to either prevent or treat the disease early on. Um, but for some things, we don't know if they're actionable. We don't know what to do about them. So for this particular case, there was nothing clearly actionable that could be done other than increased surveillance and screening for early signs of the disease. So I hope that answered your question. Your question. Your question. That was an interesting question, and th those are great answers. Thank you. Uh, next, we have a question from Karim, who asks, how can the rapid evolution of genomic affect genetic counseling? So that is a fantastic question. Um, I think one of the major challenges that we have right now is that we do not have enough genetic counselors. And even the genetic counselors that we do have, not all of them have been trained in how to do sort of what we call genomic counseling, right? So they, they may be very comfortable and familiar with how to counsel families about single gene tests that are being done, but may not be as familiar or comfortable with how to counsel around genomic findings. And so I think a lot of the, um, like we have a new genetic counseling master's program that's starting at Baylor College of Medicine, and I think that will focus a lot on sort of genomic counseling and training people and being comfortable with genome-wide results and, and how to interpret that and how to counsel um, families and individuals on the basis of those results. But there's a slide that I don't have in my slide deck, but I've, I've seen before that shows the number of um, new postings for genetic counseling jobs that are out there, and, and it's up here, and the number of genetic counselors that are coming out of training programs, and it's like down here, right? So there's a huge gap um, between the perceived need for genetic counselors and the number of genetic counselors that we have um, at, our, at our disposal for, for the field. And so, you know, this raises a, a couple of issues. One is, are we going to increase the number of genetic counselors and train more people? And I think we're trying to do that. Um, and if this really scales based on that first, um, that first slide that I showed um, with regard to uh, how quickly we're, we're integrating genomics, I'm going to try to pull it back up here. If this really scales at this level of being, you know, we're doing a million now worldwide and, you know, based on any of these, we're going to be doing a billion um, genomic sequences eventually, right? If that really scales at that level, I think we're going to have to come to grips with the fact that all clinicians are going to have to feel more comfortable than they do now with helping to interpret genomic sequencing findings and helping to counsel um, patients and their families, and then really referring for the most complicated cases. So in the MedSeq study, we're actually studying that. Um, the results are being given back by primary care physicians and cardiologists, and they're receiving some minimal training from our study team, um, and then kind of we're auto, auto, audio recording their conversations with their patients to really look at how do they do when they're given a genome report and they have to educate and counsel their patients on what it means for them. And they're doing pretty well. 
um, actually. There's, there's, they're not, they're not um, having a lot of examples of misinformation or, or anything wrong, and we're watching for that. Okay, excellent. Next, we have a question from Tammy who asks, what, uh, what models allow patients to have access to their medical records, and does this impact the patient's perspective on sharing of medical data? So that's another great question, um, and it's one that I think we're really struggling with. So um, the, we had this meeting I mentioned in, in March with a lot of experts um, who are dealing with data sharing from a lot of different perspectives, and one of the key themes that came up from that meeting was that we really need to be participant-centric in how we do this. Um, and so it's, it's, it's not going to work to ask individuals to share their data and not give them access to their own information. Um, and so we need to do a much better job at not only creating the regulatory structure in all the different countries for people to be able to access their medical record and their, their genomic data and everything else, um, but to actually make it possible for them to do that. So, you know, we do have laws in place that say you can access your medical record. We actually have laws now in the United States that say you can access your um, raw data and your lab reports. But most people find that very difficult to accomplish um, and to do and you know there's kind of a whole bunch of bureaucracy they have to go to in order to get access to the information that they want. So I think that's that's an area that we really need to work on um, and I do think it's sort of a principle of reciprocity that if we're going to ask people to contribute to the medical information commons they need to be able to get back at least their own information from that same commons. Okay, great. Um, finally, we have a question from Sylvia, and her question um, pertains to ethics and data sharing from uh, the diseases uh, from born vectors to, such as mosquitoes, which I don't know if you can comment on that for, for us. Yeah, so I'm not sure I'm the right person to comment on that. I'm really sorry. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the question is. I think, you know, there, there is a huge need to be thinking about um, infectious diseases, you know, with the Zika virus and, and the other um, infectious diseases that we're seeing through mosquitoes and, and other pathogens, um, and thinking about how can we share data related to that. Um, it's not an area that I've done a tremendous amount of work in, but I think it's a really, really important area to be thinking about, um, and how do we link that with all of the other uh, medical information about individuals is, is, is going to be incredibly important. Okay, um, next we have a question from Kathleen, and her question is uh, a little bit long, so feel free to, to read along with me, uh, Amy. She asks, uh, could a unique RFID type extremely confidential label be assigned to any data originating from each individual patient? Um, and then she says, this could then uh, be used to identify any breach of confidentiality in the use or accessibility of their data and allow for the individual patient to monitor their data use. Okay, yeah, so I'm, I'm trying to look at this. Again, I'm not sure if I'm the best person to answer this, but I do think that there's ways um, to identify breaches in confidentiality, and there are certain groups, I would, I think the group out of Vanderbilt is probably, um, to my knowledge, the most forward thinking on this and how they're tracking access to data and looking at sort of legitimate use and identifying breaches in, in data access. Um, and they have a very sophisticated sort of informatics way of doing this um, that it's a one-way filtration system. I don't fully understand it. Brad Mallon is kind of the expert on this, and for those who are interested in this topic, I'd recommend that you um, reach out to him. But I do think there's ways to do this, and I think the issue that you bring up um, with regard to um, focusing not on the front end, which is data access, right? Um, so restricting who can access the data, putting it behind many, many firewalls, et cetera, but rather focusing more 
on the back end of who is in an unauthorized fashion accessing data, who's using data in harmful ways or against you know, data use agreements, and really having um, sort of strong punishments um, or consequences for that type of misuse. I think that's where we need to be focusing a little bit more. As I mentioned in Europe, um, the Human Tissue Act really sort of criminalizes the analysis of DNA without consent. That's one approach. Um, I'm, you know, we can argue about whether that's the right approach, but at least it focuses on sort of what are people doing with the data if they have access to it and not so much sort of um, how are we storing the data and who's contributing it and those sorts of things. I think you need to address it from both sides. Um, but in the United States, at least, I think we have been overly focused on the front end and um, don't have as, as, as strong protections for the back end misuse. Okay, next we have a question from Diane, um, who says, the issue of genetic ownership varies across culture within the United States. Some Native Americans feel their genetic data reflects extended kinship networks, hence ownership is non-issue. Does your research seek to address issues like these, or would citizen panels have uh, a cross-cultural representation? Yeah, so thank you for that question. That's another excellent question. Um, absolutely true. Uh, different people, different cultures feel very differently about issues of ownership. Um, so our study, and, and you know, I'm glad you brought up Native Americans because I think that's a population in the United States where we have um, really sort of had an interesting relationship with those with those groups with regard to genetic research and, and the recent Havasupe tribe case in Arizona where there was a lot of controversy about the use of genetic samples from the Havasupe tribe really sort of highlighted um, some of the cultural differences and, and, and how we think about this and some of the dangers of, of not paying attention to that and being respectful of that. So our particular study is, is focused on, uh, is not focused on that. Um, we will ask those, which we try to get broad representation from different, um, you know, demographic backgrounds in our citizen panels and we will ask about values around um, ownership and so hopefully some of those issues will come up. But we are working very closely with two individuals, two scholars who are um, both Native American. Um, they're Native Americans. They're, they're, they're representatives of the um, Native American communities, and they're also scholars in ethical, legal, and social implications of genetics and genomics. So Jesse Bardill and um, uh, Nanaba Garrison. Um, they're both consultants on our project, and we're working with them to try to figure out can we um, do some parallel research with the um, Native American community to try to see how we can um, sort of be respectful of and be attentive to the particular particular cultural values that exist in those communities. And they'll differ, a, a, you know, I, I don't want to say that all Native American tribes have the same culture around this either. I think there are a lot of differences in, in various communities and we need to be very sensitive to that. Okay, if there, are more, or if there are no more questions, I would like to thank those of you who asked such excellent and engaging questions. And of course, I would like to thank Dr. McGuire again for her excellent presentation. Do you have any final comments for us before we leave? I just want to thank everybody for joining us. This has um, been really great, and it's been wonderful to engage with you the last couple of minutes. And soon, thank you very much for moderating um, and for inviting me to be a part of this conference. Okay. It was wonderful, and we'd love to have you again. So before we, we go, uh, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing until November 2016. You receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast is available for replay, and we encourage you to share that link with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all we have for now, and we thank you for joining, and we hope to see you again next time. Bye-bye.